Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Whiteboard Finance Show. My guest today is Nick Loper. If you guys are familiar with his podcast, Side Hustle Nation, then you already know that this is going to be a value-packed episode. Uh, right now, he has about 113,000 listeners. Uh, he has an email list of 65,000 people, and currently, it looks like he's at 428 podcast episodes. Uh, welcome to the show, Nick. How you doing? Marco, what's going on, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure, buddy. Thank you for coming on. Uh, so you and I first met at uh, FinCon in D.C. This is about a year and a half ago, two years ago now at this point. Um, so what made you start Side Hustle Nation? And uh, I've actually been a listener of Side Hustle Nation for many, many years. And to meet you in person was really cool. Um, what made you want to leave that you know corporate rat race and start your own side hustle here? Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. That's that means the world to me that somebody would spend spend time with with me in their earbuds and my guests in their earbuds. Um, for me, Side Hustle Nation was a side project to the original side hustle that uh, let me quit my corporate job. So it's kind of like a couple layers removed from the uh, from the rat race there. But yeah, I was working corporate uh, fresh out of college and could not see myself there for the you know the next thirty years of the cubicle life. Or, like I had no desire to climb the corporate ladder. So it's like, how do I work my way out of this? Uh, the business that I was running at the time was a footwear comparison shopping site. This was um, back when comparison shopping was was more of a thing. Like, hey, you know, 18 different stores sell the same thing, where you can find the best price, what coupons are available, all that stuff. Worked on an affiliate model where, um, in my case, Zappos, Amazon, um, Shoes.com, like, you know, all these companies would all pay a commission for orders that were sourced through the site. That was the the vehicle that let me uh, quit the corporate job, and it was years and years of running that, where you know finally got up the nerve to to start the podcast. Like you know, Mike tap tap, you know, is this thing on? Like is anybody <laughs> listening? And uh, and shift over an old personal blog that I had, you know, over to Side Hustle Nation. Say like I'm, uh, you know, is kind of as the result of some soul searching. Like, what do you want to be known for when people Google you? What do you never get tired about talking about? A lot of the same questions that you know I will ask aspiring side hustlers trying to choose their niche, choose their ideas. Like for me, it was like I really kind of geek out on reverse engineering these different business models, figuring out where the money comes from. That kind of stuff was uh, was interesting and still is interesting, like you said, 428 episodes later. Very nice, very nice. Um, so how long did it take you to transition from that cubicle life uh, to full-time doing this? Uh, it was three years of nights and weekends for me um, on the shoe business. And then kind of, so that was like in the 2008 timeframe when I left that job. Um, Side Hustle Nation started in 2013. And so within a year and a half, that had become kind of my main focus. So the the sun was setting on the shoe business around that time and had a couple other projects that were doing okay, especially in the early days of the site. It was very much like, I'll be the guinea pig. I'll be the uh, experimenter and go and test out a bunch of different stuff, report back on the results. And that has shifted a little bit over the years, like still trying to do a little bit of that and do the case study thing. Cause it's a, it's a ton of fun, but it's, uh, shifted a little bit to playing more journalist and just sourcing other people who've who've been there, done that. Of course, of course. Okay. So what is your, out of these 428 episodes, uh, what is your favorite episode just that you did personally? What Maybe it was the guest, maybe it was the side hustle itself. And then which, which episode ended up being most popular and what was their side hustle? Oh my gosh. A personal favorite. It's like asking to pick a favorite kid. I don't know if I can, uh, I don't know if I could do that. There are a few that stand out and even one from the very early days, like uh, kind of put the show on the map and, and, you know, relatively speaking, of course, because you look at the numbers and it, it didn't really justify it, but there was a gentleman that I connected with, I want to say in Chicago who had earned enough money on Fiverr uh, to buy a house and Fiverr, if you don't know back then, especially was kind of the at least to me, was known as the $5 marketplace. So I was like, dude, what are you possibly selling for $5? We could earn that much money. He's like, Nick, 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 you know, it's all about the upsells. I was like, okay, <laughs> tell me more, you know? Um, but it was that conversation. It was the having the the foresight to put that as the hook of the episode. Um, hey, you made enough money on Fiverr to buy a house. Like making podcast episodes intriguing, clickable, you know, curiosity inducing because there's an 
overhead. There's a hurdle to get somebody to get this onto their device, especially back in the early days. I mean, that was my first introduction to podcasting. It's like I probably followed a link from Twitter or someplace. At, and then I get to the page and there's nothing here. Like, and then you re, you see the little like player, you know, oh, you realize this is you buried whatever the promise from the headline was 40 minutes deep into some MP3. Like, I, you know, I'm and so it's got to be good enough. It's got to be compelling enough to make somebody uh, go through that mm-hmm. hoop. So I was really fortunate to learn that early on, thanks to this uh, this gentleman on Fiverr. Yeah, I feel like um, I need to uh, I need to implement that into my own podcast just because I kind of just press record and I edit the video and I edit the audio, but I need to create that beginning, you know, that hook of, from the actual episode itself. And then, you know, hopefully that hooks the listener. Right now, I'm just starting it off with, you know, hey, everybody, welcome back to the Whiteboard Finance Show. And I kind of cross my fingers and hope people listen. Um, what was that? If you can disclose, what was that gentleman doing? What was his side hustle? So his side hustle was related to copywriting and PR. And so his like $5 thing was like, I'll send you the, you know, the seven step sequence to, uh, to a killer, like autoresponder sequence for your email list or something. And it was like, you know, pre-written took him two seconds to deliver. But then uh, if you wanted his specific expertise, like you could buy that in the upsells, I will write email number one for you. I will write email number two for you. And so that's kind of how he had scaled it. And ultimately I think went on to sell like, you know, multi-thousand dollar packages through the through the Fiverr platform, which was really wow. which was really interesting. Something I didn't know uh, was possible at that time. Yeah, I personally use Fiverr. Um, the the woman who did my voiceover for the intro and the outro of this podcast. I haven't introduced the intro yet because I feel like it's just maybe a little bit slow, and I want to get that path of least resistance for people to start listening to the actual episode itself. So I've only uploaded her outro. Um, but yeah, she she had the whole upsell package as well. And then all the graphic designing for uh, this channel specifically, and then also for like the podcast um, thumbnail, that was all from Fiverr. Yeah. And there's a lot of talented people on there. You just need to know how to kind of like sift through it because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of junk on there as well. But once you understand like who the real players are on there, you can get a really good um, service or quality product for super cheap. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, and, and people who yeah. have tons of reviews and stuff, they've got their processes dialed in, and yeah, it's a it's a good place to find talent. It's also a good place to be found if you are that freelancer or if you are that agency. So, we've talked to several Fiverr sellers on the on the podcast where it's like, look, you know, go where the cash is already flowing. It's flowing here. So, you know, I want to put my uh, buy button up for sale here. Absolutely. So, which which episode was the most popular? Was that the most popular one? Because I remember looking, I think it had something to do with like Amazon FBA or something based on your website. I just searched by popularity. Um, do you see okay. that? Do you see that being like a fad or do you see, um, you know, that's still being a thing? That Amazon Actually, FBA. FBA stuff was, was hot for a lot of years. Um, I want to say the most popular of all time right now is an episode we did related to drop shipping where this guy was selling uh, giant commercial bounce houses, which were like you know, these several thousand dollar uh, things. But he started out, he doesn't have to touch the inventory. He doesn't care how big they are, um, but had made relationships with the uh, manufacturers or with the suppliers and said, hey, would you would you mind? If I, could, if I could sell these for you, if I could help find these customers for you, would you ship them? to them on my behalf. And, you know, he found five or six companies to say yes. And so he built this little drop shipping website. It was called bouncehousestore.com or something. This is a couple summers ago. Fascinating episode. He had a really specific research process that he went through um, to say like, you know, how many Google searches does this get a month? What does competition look like? How affordably can I buy traffic um, uh, on like Google ads? You had all this criteria and it was, it was really interesting. So I think he's gone out and branched into a few other drop shipping stores too because he's like well bounce houses are kind of seasonal so i wanted something to fill in the gaps like in the winter months it's like okay very he's nice doing really well very cool so speaking of side hustles other than uh, side hustle nation you're kind of your baby or your i would call it your bread and butter i'm just guessing just because that's where i see you most active on um you actually ended up selling a other side hustle blog uh, i believe it had something to do with virtual assistants or vas can you tell us a little bit about that yeah, this was a project that I started actually before Side Hustle Nation. This was like a, one of the original side hustles to the to the shoe business, and one of the one of the few that that actually took off. So it started you know several projects that didn't really go anywhere. This was a 
kind of a comparison and review site for uh, for outsourcing services like Yelp for virtual assistant companies is kind of how I uh, considered it. And it operated on a lead generation affiliate model. Um, it was a little bit of display advertising, a little bit of kind of featured listings, taking a page out of Yelp's playbook, out of TripAdvisor's playbook. Well, it's like, yeah, they, they'll sell you a featured listing placement at the top of the directory too. This was uh, always a very part-time project, but it was an industry that I was interested in and I was, you know, had some experience hiring uh, and, and managing remote workers, or at least I felt like I had some experience in that area. Mm-hmm. And, and from my own pains and struggles, like, you know, which of these companies are legit and how does it all work? So I didn't, I didn't know anything when I started and over nine years of running the site had, you know, grown it to 400 something company reviews and, and uh, thousands and thousands of user reviews but ended up selling that uh, last fall as, you know, was a nice, you know, a low six figure exit, but over the life of the business, it generated over half a million dollars worth of revenue from something that realistically probably never spent more than 10, 15 hours a week on even at its peak. So it was a very rewarding side hustle and kind of my first exposure to a lot of the online business stuff with uh, even my first YouTube videos, my first Twitter account, my first email list. It was uh, a, a great training ground in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Um, so how did that even get discovered by the potential buyer or the actual buyer itself? Was it through like a website broker or how did you even make that connection or that relationship? It was interesting. So I had, you know, kind of quietly put the feelers out for the last year and a half or so and and had some semi-serious conversations with other people in the industry, looking at it from a strategic acquisition standpoint, like, oh, we already run a VA company. Uh, How many leads do you think we could get from this site? Or we run a complimentary software product. Like how many leads could we potentially get from this this website? But ended up um, connecting with Dom Wells from onfolio.co, who runs kind of a, not, it's kind of not, not, not necessarily a full-scale brokerage, but it's kind of a website investing and management type of platform because they own and operate some of their own uh, portfolio of sites. And so there's a button at the top, like connected with Dom on the podcast, actually as part of the same um, uh, side hustle showdown series that you were a part of over the summer. Yep. So we did, so you were on and talking about podcasting versus YouTube and uh, and I'm happy to see you making the leap to the dark side of the podcasting side. <laughs> the dark side. Um, but Dom, uh, Dom was on talking about, you know, should I buy a website or should I build a website? And so we had a fun little debate about that. But at the top of Onfolio, there was a button that said, like, sell us your website or sell us your online business. I was like, well, let's just see what happens here. And, you know, it's like, you know, here's the traffic. Here's the revenue picture, you know, and kind of like, you know, what do you think? What do you think this is worth? And he, you know, pretty quickly wrote back, like, you know what, I think I might actually have a buyer for you. And wow. so he ended up kind of playing connector there because um, I have a buyer program that the couple who ended up buying it was part of uh, that came with a little bit of handholding and due diligence and vetting and and some onboarding uh, suggestions like here's, <laughs> and that was my fear. It was like, you know, here's all, here's the list of 10 things that you could do immediately to triple revenue and then, you know, flip it for three times the price. Like, yeah. I, don't want, I don't want to be that kind of case study, but um, at the same time, very excited for the future of the industry and what they'll be able to do because it is it is early days for remote work, and so I think they're they're primed to have a, a a healthy asset for years to come there. Absolutely, I think that whole laptop lifestyle and then digital entrepreneurship, where people such as you know maybe yourself or myself, where we need you know an extra helping hand, but at the same time you can get it for so much you know better value overseas. You know whether it's from you know the Philippines or you know India or whatever. Um, these are super educated people. Most of them speak English. And, you know, for us as entrepreneurs, it makes all the sense in the world. Instead of hiring a W-2 employee in the States that may come with certain things like, you know, health insurance and like, you know, retirement plans and all that. To me, that's just a lot of um, not red tape, but just a lot of like stuff to worry about as opposed to these virtual assistants where you can pretty much like 1099 them, if I understand that correctly. Yeah, well, overseas, you don't even need to worry about the 1099. But the funny thing is a lot of the top performing companies were in the States. And I think the appeal was, okay, we it's a very disjointed industry, which I think is an opportunity, broadly speaking, for a lot of different side hustles. Like if there's no dominant uh, regional or uh, 
you know, local or regional player in your space, like for house cleaning, gutter cleaning, junk hauling, like, you know, all these kind of non-sexy local type of services, because the, you know, virtual assistants have been around since, you know, as long as the internet, but it was very disjointed. And so some, a couple of companies came in and said, well, if we slap our brand on it and our processes and our recommendations and like, you know, build it up to a brand still hiring from the same uh, pool of, you know, work from home, administrative professionals type of people, um, but able to command a premium price. And from the business owner perspective, like you said, I don't have to worry about payroll and taxes. It's just kind of a, a single line item expense. And that makes it, especially for a young company, like just to not have to worry about that stuff. And, you know, hey, I just need somebody five, 10, 20 hours a week. Like, I don't know if I need somebody full time and to deal with all the headache that comes with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So now that you've kind of evolved from, you know, cubicle. Yeah, I don't want to say monkey, but that's what I called myself. You know, I, I worked in cubicle life my whole life, um, pretty much worked in sales and an analyst role in finance. But uh, basically, now that you've evolved or kind of graduated from the W2 to kind of side hustling nights and weekends to it being full time, what are some takeaways that you would recommend to my listeners that are trying to aspire to become an entrepreneur? It doesn't have to be in the digital field, but just in general, just owning your own business and building your own, um, you know, uh, eating what you kill kind of a thing. <laughs> yeah, the biggest thing for me, it kind of took me a long time to figure out because I, I feel like I started the shoe business for the noble enterprise of how, how can I make money online, which I, you know, we've probably all Googled <laughs> at a certain point. Um, what is what it's took take me a long time to realize was like, you know, money follows value. So you want to make money online. The short, there's a million and one ways to get it done. The short answer is how can you be helpful? Like, how can you help someone? Like, that's the easiest way to do it. And it, and it just comes down to looking for problems. Like what problems do you have in your own life? What questions are you having a hard time getting answered? What have you overcome? Like, what do people complain about to you on a daily basis? Could it be your coworkers? Could it be your family? What, um, and you, I call this like the what sucks exercise. And I, I try and be more optimistic the rest of the time. So it's kind of like a pessimistic place to live. But if you do this for a day, a week, a couple of weeks, like just call it like your what sucks folder on your phone. And just like everything that kind of just annoys you, grates on you a little bit, like just make a note of it. And on the other side of that, there might be a business opportunity, either one that already exists. And if it does, that's fine. You know, most ideas don't have to be completely never before seen. Um, but on the other side of that, there might be, there might be something there to explore. Like if it's a pain for me, it might be a pain for, for somebody else as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I used to look at the analogy of like, you know, are you a Tylenol? Are you a Band-Aid? Are you like, you know, morphine? Like, are you kind of like masking a problem <laughs> or are you kind of like being an inventor and kind of creating a whole new, um, it could be a service. It could be va value to use your word, to bring value into the marketplace. And I actually used to have a similar process when I was younger in college, I had, um, uh, old Blackberry. And I had a like a to do list app on my main screen and I would write down all the stuff that like would pop into my head throughout the day for entrepreneurial like endeavors, like just ideas. Right. And it was similar. It. <laughs> yeah, it was similar to your like what sucks, you know, um, you know, strategy because you kind of just as an entrepreneur, you're just solving, you know, pain points all throughout the day. Um, and I think that once you hone it down and kind of get a system behind it, that's when you can really start scaling. Um, yeah. Are you are you still solo now at this point, or do you have a system behind uh, Side Hustle Nation? There's a small team of kind of specialist freelancers, I would call them. So I've got you know a, a couple of different administrative support people, some content writing support, some social media support, uh, some tech support, and I've gone the route lately of. Uh, of hiring agencies for a lot of that stuff rather than individuals, um, like some dedicated PR support that I'm testing out. I don't know, just trying to play around with uh, with running really lean. So for the past couple of years, I've been probably north of 85% profit margin, which my mastermind will kind of tell you like, there's there might be such thing as running too lean. You know, why don't you reinvest some of that a little bit and see what happens? Um, that's kind of on the on the horizon for this year. Yeah, that makes sense. I think me as a YouTuber, like owning my own digital media company, um, you know, it's literally just me. I'm, I always point in these podcasts to the left and people are like, what the hell is he pointing at? <laughs> my, my whiteboard is to my left. So I just do that instinctively. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm literally just a guy in front of a whiteboard. I press record, I edit everything, I do everything on my own. Um, yes, I could probably outsource that because I hate trading time, you know, for money kind of a thing. But at the same time, it, it's such a lean operation that there really isn't a need to introduce too much overhead. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, I forgot the book. I think it's called The E-Myth, where it's like you can be the best baker in the world, but you don't want to, um, it doesn't mean you can own a bakery, right? It's like you don't want to yeah. be staying up till two in the morning, you know, baking these cakes when you can actually create a system and a process behind it. All you need to know is how to teach people how to bake the cakes kind of a thing. Um, so, yeah, I'm at the point in my business now where I'm exploring, you know, should I outsource certain things? Um, I know email for me is a pain in the butt, man. I get so many emails and direct messages every day. And it's like, I feel like I still want to be genuine and reply to all these things myself, but it's just such a time suck, you know, and I feel, I genuinely feel bad if I don't get to everyone. Um, is there any like workarounds that you know of that or other than cloning myself? <laughs> uh, cloning yourself. I mean, one thing that's been helpful for me, and I don't know if you have gone down the same path or would consider it, but, um, cause yeah, similar, like get a lot of, uh, emails and, and questions. And it's like, I, 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 probably could come up with a coherent answer for you, like, or at least point you to some, some resources, but instead, like I'm trying to be uh, pointing people or have my, my new email administrative person pointing people to the Facebook group instead. Hey, there's side hustle nation community on Facebook. It's about, you know, almost 30,000 members strong at this point. Uh, Nick's in there. Uh, other moderators are in there. Odds are somebody knows the answer to this question or can point you in the right direction. So uh, due to the volume that we receive, we can't, you know, reply to everybody uh, individually. But if you do pop in over there, uh, your your odds of getting an answer are a little bit stronger. And so, the, and that builds up the community as well. It's been, I guess, a surprising benefit of that is like, instead of now, you know, you and I broadcast, you know, one to many, and it's an awesome business, it scales, it's low overhead, right? It's got a ton of benefits, but it's still like it's, it can be a little bit of an echo chamber. And so the, the community allows a many to many, all of a sudden now, people who have you in common uh, can interact with each other. I think it's kind of cool to be at the, at the hub or at the center of a group like that. That's funny. I, I got that same. So I have a, a consulting client who consults with me regarding her finances, and she gave that same exact tip to me in a private conversation. Basically, she has an email admin, and anything that comes in for her, you know, basically they redirect her, uh, the person sending the email or asking the question back to the community. Um, and I think that's super, super smart. That reminds me of that uh, Mr. Money Mustache, if you're familiar with him. Um, he's got a forum mm -hmm. on his website, and it's kind of like, to your point, you know, you and I could be the hub, or Mr. Money Mustache is the hub, or my client, she's the hub, but it's kind of like a like and similar um, audience, if you will, and they're helping each other as opposed to just everything coming from Nick or Marco or, you know, Mr. Money Mustache, for example. Yeah, and that way you get you know, five, five or 10 people's uh, take on it rather than just one guy. It's like, Absolutely. I don't have all the answers. Exactly. That's the other thing. It's like, I don't have all the answers. I try and make uh, content that I'm, um, that I have experience in and that I can bring value about, but I don't know every single question under the sun, you know, that'd be almost impossible. Um, so I also was noticing on your blog, you do these annual reviews. Uh, I think they're mostly financial. So do they keep you on track or what is the point of doing like, you know, Q4 review, Q1 review, that kind of a thing. And I believe your wife is involved as well. Yeah. Well, she's, you know, often a part of what's going on in, in life during those quarters. It's for me, it's a chance to break down what worked, what didn't work, what I worked on, you know, the results phase. And because it's easy for me to get caught up in the day-to-day -day and the maintenance, and I got to come up with another episode. And, you know, it's a chance to kind of itemize out like, okay, what growth projects did you work on? Did that move the needle in some way? And I think other people are interested in saying like, oh, what are you experimenting with? What are you tweaking with? And it kind of is inspired a little bit by Amazon, where I read somewhere that they're running at any given time, like a thousand different A-B tests or something like on their website, which wouldn't surprise me at all, trying to eke out, you know, another 0.01%, you know, conversion rate or something like that. Yep. But I think we can apply that same mentality and maybe not a thousand tests at once, but like have a couple things that you're testing out every month, either in, you know, your personal life or your business. Like what would happen if I, you know, woke up at 5.30 and did a high intensity workout first day? Like what would happen if I actually drink the eight glasses of water? You know, what would happen if I cut out refined sugar? Like what, what would happen, you know, all these different things. And then, you know, on the business side, what would happen if I wrote 500 words a day? What would happen if I, if I hired somebody to run Pinterest for me? Or so, you know, it's just low, relatively low risk type of activities and you kind of measure the results from that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. I think um, one of my biggest weaknesses is A-B testing either thumbnails or titles on YouTube. And I can apply this to a million other facets or angles in my life. But 
Um, I think that especially being a marketer, um, not me specifically, but I'm just saying for the people that are listening that are interested in getting into marketing or selling a product, I think A-B testing is one of the easiest big wins that you can do, and it takes relatively low effort. Um, I just haven't done it. So um, we'll see. Have you ever, have you eked out, you know, and what's your biggest win, I guess, by doing the A-B testing? I don't know. I mean, some of them are related to, you know, email open rates, like, oh, this subject, you know, I used to be like, okay, I'll send this subject line to 10% of the list. And I'll send this subject line to 10% of the list. And then like, whichever one uh, was the winner, like I would send out to 80% of the list. I don't necessarily mess around with that much uh, anymore. And I will say like, unless you're operating at, you know, half a million YouTube subscribers, unless you're operating at some sort of scale, like the color of the button on your website, you know, if you get 20 visitors a day, it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. you know, focus on growing the traffic first and, uh, and then kind of measure and tweak these, these little things. I mean, some of the, like the personal stuff that has worked is like kind of the, like, I feel better with that early morning workout. I feel better with this intermittent fasting. I feel better when I, uh, you know, take care of my body by not feeding garbage fuel. Um, so some of those are very clear winners and it's kind of, it's not even surprising. It's like, oh yeah, of course you, of course you do. You feel better when you're not eating garbage. Um, but it's like, it's helpful to, you know, make that mental note when you're faced with that decision, when the garbage is in front of you. It's Absolutely. Like, okay, let's, I'm a let's, big, let's avoid that stuff. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. I'm a big fan of what gets measured, gets managed. And that's kind of why I do like my, um, my wife and I, we do a monthly net worth check. And this isn't some like okay. deep dive where we take, you know, two hours every month. This is literally like, Hey, you know, want to go grab lunch or we'll make, you know, lunch or breakfast or dinner. It'll take literally, you know, 10, 15 minutes. We talk about some stuff and it's done. You know, it just, it's kind of a quick check it shows us where we're at, uh, in terms of, you know, our finances, where we can improve, where we did well, where we didn't do so well. And just measuring stuff in your life, just, you know, it, when you visualize it and write it down, kind of like that, what sucks strategy, when you <laughs> see things written down, it just helps you, you know, attack certain things in a certain way. Um, so you mentioned earlier, when that's, we were a, that's a good uh, metric to manage, to, uh, to track, by the way, I think other people, sure. um, you know, they have a sense of what they're bringing in every month. Hopefully they have a sense of what they're spending, but then this end game of like, what are, what are we worth? Like, I think that was, um, and it was Mr. Money Mustache that kind of introduced me to that idea. Um, and he was like, well, you, you know, you gotta, it's the 4% rule. You gotta save 25 times your annual expenses. And which for a lot of people is like, I'm never going to get there. Like yeah. it's the world's most depressing stat. But for us, like, you know, we had a reasonably, uh, we had a decent financial ground game. Like we were always savers and lived a relatively frugal life. And so for us, it was like, oh, like that's not, like it, it became motivating in a way. It's like, oh, we're, we're closer than we thought. Like if we yeah. don't, you know, uh, you know, fall victim to the inevitable lifestyle creep of, of kids and everything else. But, um, it was, it was helpful to kind of have that, uh, that milestone in mind. Yeah, absolutely. I think it becomes almost like a goal, you know, if you want to, whatever, it could be diet, it could be a certain weight loss number. It could be, I want to get six packs abs by the summer, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, it's something to work towards, but you're right. If, if you are definitely either in lower income or if you didn't come from a strong financial foundation, you know, you multiply your annual expenses and you're just like, dude, this is not attainable. I can never get there. <laughs> But I think that uh, if you start early, um, I think if I had to guess, the demographic of this podcast is probably similar to my YouTube channel. It's going to be people that are probably your age, my age, and younger, probably to their early, you know, mid twenties when they start getting their first big boy, big girl job, and they start making, you know, their fifty, sixty, seventy, hundred thousand dollars a year out of college, um, and they start realizing, oh, okay, you know, I can't get, you know, Starbucks every day. I can't blow money at the, you know, nightclub every night. You know, that kind of a thing. Um, I, I see the biggest mistake of people always buying like, you know, a really nice car and financing it for a million months. Um, but when they start realizing like, oh, okay, you know, this is a depreciating asset, meaning that I'm, my net worth is going down over time because of this thing. You know, I think once they flip that switch and trying to get into that, um, rich dad, poor dad mentality of assets versus liabilities. Yeah. Um, I think that's when the light bulb goes off. And I think that's when people start taking their finances seriously. Um, so yeah, how, just uh, mechanically, oh, ahead, yeah, are you using, um, like a personal capital to track that so, net worth or some sort of aggregator tool? I do have personal capital. Uh, for some reason, a couple of my accounts, they don't link properly and it's just been a pain in the butt to kind of get them to link. So I just created my own spreadsheet. Um, so basically what I do is I take all of my assets and then I take all of my liabilities. So anything that has value that I own, um, whether it's, whether it's stocks, bonds, real estate, you know, mutual funds, whatever, crypto, whatever. 
um, anything that has value in it, even material possessions. I even take my cars because they're worth something. If I had to sell them today, they're still worth something. Um, and then I kind of depreciate those out over time as well. Uh, and then I take my liabilities and I basically subtract those two line items. And then I basically give each category a percentage goal of my net worth. So say it's stocks. I want X amount of percent of my portfolio or my net worth to be in stocks or equities. Um, same thing with, you know, like Bitcoin, for example, same thing with gold, same thing with real estate. So I think once you kind of create that like visual pie, um, it helps you kind of visualize like, oh, okay, a chunk of my pie is in real estate. It's it's either severely, you know, overweight or severely underweight, or I'm right where I need to yeah. be. And that really helps me kind of stay in check. And it keeps me from like, you know, oh, you know, fear of missing out. Tesla's exploding, you know, Bitcoin's exploding. <laughs> I got to, you know, you know, blow my next paycheck on it kind of a thing. So it really helps you stay in line and assign certain weights to each part of your portfolio. Yes. Yeah. I like that. Um, and you can look up, you know, your, your golden butterfly and your other oh, different yeah. portfolio theories and, and all that stuff. But that's helpful to think of it as, uh, as a percentage of net worth. So we, like Marco said, what you own minus what you owe, that's your net worth and trying to see like, uh, okay, where, where should I put this? And I've got another pie chart that, uh, I'd love to talk about if you, if you're willing, course, and I call this of kind of the, the passive income pie chart. And so everybody who starts out their, their working careers, you know, in, in probably 99% of cases, trading time for money. And that's natural. That's normal. Like there's no problem with that. You know, for me, it was, uh, you know, cutting grass and babysitting and, and painting houses eventually. And then, uh, what, you know, all sorts of <laughs> working at the restaurant. That was like my favorite job. Um, all that stuff, right. Trading time for money. Um, but like Warren Buffett says, like if you don't figure out a way to make money in your sleep, you're going to work until you die. So right. over the course of your lifetime, the goal is to change that pie chart from time for money to passive income, right? And it's like maybe you buy your first dividend stock or you're in a little bit of you know 0.5% savings interest, right? You have this little sliver of passive income or you start you know your YouTube channel, you start your online business, you start something where it becomes a little bit time leveraged. It's not necessarily passive. Maybe it's a slightly different shade on that pie chart, but it's like, okay, I didn't directly have to work for that. It wasn't directly tied to, you know, somebody, I showed up for an hour, somebody paid me for that hour. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's like trying to grow that piece of pie over time. And looking back at, at my pie chart, it's like almost all of the activity now is time leveraged, which feels really good. Like I, you know, tend to say no to, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching and consulting almost all the time, just cause it's like, I, it stresses me out like for, for a lot of different, <laughs> you know, personal hangups. Um, but you know, if I look back 10, 15 years ago when I was still working, it was like, it probably was dramatically different. And so it doesn't get there overnight, but it's something that you, um, honestly need to dedicate, uh, even if it's just an hour a week, you know, four hours on a Saturday, you got to dedicate some time and some thought to this. Cause if you don't do it, like nobody else is going to do it for you. I, I completely agree. And I think that um, once you become either a business owner or someone that understands that when you create these systems to bring in money, literally while you sleep, I know that's kind of like the sexy, you know, martini on the beach or margarita on the beach, excuse me, like, I, that's the that's the allure that, you know, gets people into it. But to your point, you know, passive income, it takes a massive amount of effort, uh, at least in the beginning to build that base or that foundation. And then after that, it starts to become time leveraged to your point. And I really agree with that. I think that um, since I come from a more like traditional financial background, you know, you're taught the, you know, assets and liabilities and income and this and that, which is great. But one, to your point with the, with the uh, Warren Buffett quote, excuse me, you know, if you don't figure out a way to earn passive income or make your money work for you, you will definitely be working until you're, you know, in your sixties, uh, especially given the way that the middle class is going now in this country. But um, I think that if you have the like the heart and the ambition to at least experiment, like you mentioned, you had a bunch of, you know, failed um, projects, but the couple ones that did succeed, those are the ones that allowed you to sustain this, you know, quote unquote, laptop lifestyle. Um, I'm actually glad you brought that up. How has not uh, living in that cubicle or working in that cubicle, you know, for 30, 40 years for the foreseeable future? How has that changed just like your outlook on life, your your well-being? I mean, are you miserable? Are you happy? You know, how has Side Hustle Nation kind of changed Nick in general? Um, I'm in a much better place today than when I started it. Um, because again, started it from some of this like kind of low point, soul searching, like what do you want to do? And it's and it's this, you don't know if it's gonna work. And there's this, you know, 
you putting in all these hours, all this effort, and it's something that you're interested in. It's something that you're excited about. It's something that you, you know, that you, you feel like the world needs and you just, you don't know. Cause there's, I, I wish I had the secret sauce to tell you why the show has taken off. Like why, you know, for all of the podcasts out there that didn't work, you know, cause I don't consider myself the world's greatest speaker or order. And that's why it's like, you know, help to turn the mic to somebody else, let them talk. Right. You don't yeah. have to be the expert. Um, but there was already a bunch of, you know, entrepreneurial interview shows out there. Mixergy was huge. Uh, Rise to the Top was huge. EO Fire was going strong. Fire, yep. uh, it's like, did, uh, you know, did the world need another one? Probably not, but it was trying to find a unique take on it. Um, I mean, I, I am amazingly grateful to be able to do what I do. I feel like I've got the best job in the world trying to source uh, interesting, compelling side hustles, things I never would have thought of. And, you know, that was, that was something I was legitimately stressed out about early on. Like uh, if I commit to doing this every week, am I going to run out of content? Am I going to run out of ideas? You know, seven years, 400 episodes later, it's like, no, the well, the well does not run dry. There's a million and one creative ways uh, for people to make money. And it's, it's, I feel very fortunate to be the guy uh, to get to showcase those. Well, I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. Um, I know why you've been successful and it boils down to one word. Uh, this is my opinion. It's consistency. Uh, you've been doing this, you know, day in, day out or week in, week out, you know, for years now. And I remember listening to you. Um, what was I just graduating college or no, this is probably like mid twenties. Like this was, I think I was like, I, I started feel old. No, seriously. I feel old too, dude. <laughs> I graduated college 10 years ago, but I think it's your consistency. And that's where a lot of people get hung up on that start a new business. Um, they either don't believe in themselves or they lose that fire or that excitement or that passion and they kind of just quit. Right. But there's that, there's that point to where whatever, you know, your channel, my channel, your podcast, you know, my show it just gets to a point where it's like chugging along, chugging along. You know, you see some wins, some very small wins. You see a lot of, you know, a lot of days where you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I dedicating all this time to this? And then all of a sudden something clicks to where, you know, it's not necessarily hockey stick growth, but, you know, it starts to compound on itself, almost like an investment portfolio in a way. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, even after my son was born and this was early 2016, so it was like three years deep into the show and he'd go to daycare to be, they had a, like a daily rate and it was like 75 bucks a day. And I'd have to look at myself in the mirror. Like, did I make 75 bucks today? Like at some days, yes. Some days I was like, I, I don't know if I did. <laughs> it's kind of tricky. <laughs> That's um, funny. So that was tough. Um, are you connected with uh, Todd Treseder from financialmentor.com? No, I'm actually not familiar with him. No. Okay. So Todd is, um, Todd reminds me a lot of my dad. So he's an older guy, um, excellent skier. Like he's got that going for him. Um, what Todd said is, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to butcher his quote, but he basically said like, despite all these failed projects, he had a couple that hit and that was enough. And so Todd's idea was like the same thing. If you give yourself enough at bats and you keep your downside risk low enough, which you really can do in these types of online business, like it doesn't require a ton of upfront investment. It's almost inevitable that you find something that hits, you know, as long as you're building something with enough upside, right? It's like minimize the downside and, you know, aim for that big win, aim for that three run homer, and you're bound to find something like he called it, you know, the law of wealth building. And it's like, if you, if you take enough swings, it almost becomes inevitable. And I thought that was really powerful to, to frame, um, to frame entrepreneurship. It's like, yeah, even if the first thing doesn't hit, okay, what's the worst thing that happened? Hopefully you didn't go bankrupt doing it. You know, try again. What'd you learn from that and, and get going? I'll never forget what my mom said. Um, so I started doing like Amazon private labeling uh, years ago. I was creating these like uh, acrylic bird feeders. They're suction cups. They stick to your windows and I, I private labeled it, you know, almost got like a patent. Like I went, I was going deep down the rabbit hole. I'm like, this is it. This is the million dollar idea. You know, you start doing some market okay. research. There's a bunch of other ones out there on Amazon. And I realized it was a race to zero, meaning like if my profit margin per unit was like six, seven bucks, you know, for every bird feeder sold, the top guy in China could literally just, you know, cut his price by four or five dollars. And there goes my margin. Right. So um, I kind of ended my dream there. But to your point, you know, that was a failed project. And I, I remember what my mom said. I'm like, man, I, I spent, you know, like a thousand bucks getting like prototypes and graphic design and this and that and spent hours and reviewing all this stuff. 
And she goes like, and I was like, oh, it didn't work out. She's just like, what else would you have done? You know, would you have stood on your head? Like, what else? Like, you, would you have wasted your time? You know, just like <laughs> watching Netflix or something. And she's like, at least you tried doing something, and I'll never forget that. And then uh, a couple years after that, that's when I started Whiteboard Finance. Um, to bring it back a little bit back to uh, podcasting versus YouTube, I was actually on your show over the summer um, with the other gentleman who has a pretty big podcast. I forgot his name. I apologize. Um, do you remember who that was? Yeah, it was Jonathan from Choose FI. Yeah, Jonathan from Choose FI. So he's a big proponent of podcasting. And I understood his point, you know, 100%. Um, now that you kind of uploaded your e episodes to YouTube, I know you're not kind of like an quote unquote active YouTuber, but um, you understand how the game works and how the platform works. Would you do anything differently? Um, would you jump on YouTube in 2006 or would you still, you know, go to the podcasting route? And I guess what are some pros and cons of both? Oh my gosh. Um, so podcasting is definitely this long, slow game. Like Jonathan had mentioned, it's this very powerful relationship building uh, platform where somebody's going to stick around with, put you in their earbuds for 40 minutes at a time and do it week after week after week versus YouTube is more like quick hits. YouTube is awesome for search and discovery, keyword uh, intent. YouTube has this viral element that podcasting definitely does not where, I mean, I, so I have put a bunch of my episodes up on YouTube with just like placeholder images. And most of them understandably don't do very well. Um, but some of them, like one of them now has over a hundred thousand views, which wow. is insane to me. And it's like, that's a hundred thousand people who have discovered this content who otherwise might never have found it, who you know, now are exposed to the brand, exposed to the show, who have the potential to join the email list. And it's like, you never know where your next biggest fan is going to come from. Your next, your next evangelist is going to find you. And so to me, it makes sense to, uh, to cast that net far and wide. Um, one thing that, I mean, is popular now and I'll probably experiment with is kind of like the clip format where it's like answering a specific question to really get granular on that keyword intent or mm -hmm. that keyword search uh, traffic. Yeah, similar to like a Joe Rogan clips kind of a thing. I was actually thinking about doing that for yeah. Whiteboard Finance of creating a whole separate channel just called Whiteboard Finance Clips. And you can kind of highlight little clips either from this show or from, you know, my main videos. Very cool. So what are like the plans for the future for the Side Hustle Nation brand? Um, I saw that you're doing, you know, some TED Talks. I always see you speaking at FinCon. Um, is that just a brand building strategy or are you trying to build something bigger? What's the overall plan for Side Hustle Nation? That's all kind of fun. The, the, I mean, the FinCon stuff is like my way of attempting to get back to this community that's given me so much over the years. Um, so it's always good to to see and be seen, I guess. I don't know. It doesn't, you know, it's hard to <laughs> measure the uh, uh, the impact on the bottom line from doing that stuff. The TED Talk or the TEDx Talk, I should say, was pretty interesting because this is like way back 2014. Like I probably have no business being on this stage. <laughs> I had volunteered at this event the year before. I uh, didn't know if it was going to happen again, but I pitched the organizers and say, Hey, um, you, you know, you did this great event. I volunteered. The topic was education. Um, you know, I think education doesn't do a great job of, you know, building and serving entrepreneurs for today's economy. I'd love to speak on that. And I didn't hear anything back for, you know, months and months. And eventually somebody wrote me back and they said, Hey, Nick, we got your, we got your proposal. Um, but the theme for this year is, is creativity, uh, not education. I was like, Oh, the themes change nuts. Uh, you know, but they were like, what do you, what do you have on, uh, what do you have on creativity? I was like, Oh, I can talk for creativity for days. Like, that's fine. Um, and next question was, do you have any public speaking experience? I was like, well, I've got this podcast. <laughs> and so it was kind of going down this rabbit hole. And, you know, of the 25 or so speakers that were there, I learned that you know, almost everyone except for me was in the first or second degree network of the organizers. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big light bulb. Like, look, if you, if you want to have that TEDx, you know, by your name, which was for me, a huge credibility builder, a huge authority builder, um, despite like I was a physical wreck leading up to this event, just like couldn't sleep. And my, you know, all the, the nerves, cause they did it right. You know, they got the red circle and, Oh like, yeah, in this black box theater. Oh, yeah. And it was like, huge production. it was intense. And it, yeah, like 30 seconds into my speech, my mouth is like bone dry, <laughs> which my brother tells me after the fact, like, oh, that's like a physiological stress response. And I was like, okay, I got 11 more minutes of this. Like, um, but it was, it was fascinating. So you can look up on the TED website, like what events are happening nearby you, see if you can connect, see if you can get on the radar of the organizers, because it is, it's a really powerful uh, brand building type of thing. Um, so I, I love doing that stuff. I mean, but what's, what's next? I, I never have a great answer for that. I'm working on 
a book project called 1K 100 Ways, uh, featuring stories from the community and the podcast on, um, you know, different ways people made it. People made a thousand bucks. Yep. People making a thousand bucks a month or more. It's um, it, it's been a much more challenging project than I thought. I thought this is going to be the easiest book project. You just crowdsource everything, let people fill in the blanks, and it's been like. I made the mistake of saying 100 ways early on. And so it's like, well, I got 81 <laughs> uh, solid submissions. And it's like, okay, now I got 83. So I'll you know, try to fill in the gaps at the end. But that one's uh, that one's being a fun project. Hopefully we'll get that out the door. Nice. And just trying to keep the keep the show going, playing around with different email marketing stuff. And uh, that's what's going on in 2021. That's awesome, man. Yeah, you always I always look to you for um, not, necessar- not necessarily ideas, but... Um, big picture stuff because I like how your blog is structured. I like how you have the reviews. I feel like you've, you, you're you really good at making a connection with your community. And that's something that I'm trying to work on. Me, I'm more like, I don't know if it's that I'm not aware of like, you know, I guess I am an influencer, which I really don't like that word. I don't like that title. Um, but sometimes I just like, I shit post dude. Like I post stuff on Instagram that I'd post for like my friends. You know what I mean? Like maybe I need to start taking that Uh, responsibility a little bit more seriously but I also feel like it's a double-edged sword because people really get to know me as well like kind of like who I am as a person and I feel like you do a really good job of that because I see you with pictures of your wife your kids you know your um, quarterly goals you know you're just super transparent I think that's the big way to win especially online uh, just being your genuine self so um, uh, we're coming up to almost uh, 50 minutes here. Typically, I like to end the podcast with, you know, what is one book, whether it's, you know, fictional, nonfiction, just anything that you're reading, um, what has really kind of shaped your course as an entrepreneur? What book would you recommend in general? A general book recommendation. Oh, my goodness. Um, don't don't say Rich Dad Poor Dad. That's like the answer for every podcast. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I was going to say, I'm sure, I'm sure other people have recommended that, which... Side note, it was actually kind of a formative read for me. Like as I read it in college, my roommate recommended it and, and it was like kind of solidified, you know, you know, buy assets instead of stuff. Like, you know, if you can have income from assets you control, like exceed your monthly expenses, you're free, like all that stuff. Like it was very influential for me. Um, another one that comes to mind that is really like, and, and that I really do like is called The Go-Giver and it's by Bob Berg. And this is the kind of a business parable about being helpful first, about serving others and trusting that, you know, some of that goodness, some of that reciprocity ends up coming back your way. That's something that stuck with me and and kind of read it at a time where where I think I needed to. It's like, okay, um, the businesses that I've started with, with the money in mind first didn't always go very well, but the projects that I've started with this is something that ought to exist in the world. This is something that I would find value in. Those are the ones that I've worked on long term, and those are the ones that have seen uh, have seen the most traffic and most traction. Absolutely, I've heard of the Go Giver. I haven't read it personally, but that is an excellent piece of advice. Um, when I started Whiteboard Finance, it was just to start teaching financial literacy. I didn't have an end goal in mind with it, um, but inevitably, whether it's the universe or the software program that we're living in, or God, or whatever you want to call <laughs> this, um, you know, it all comes back to you in the end, uh, either through reciprocity or through karma or just through value. Um, One of the biggest things that I noticed, and probably selfishly, one of the reasons why I started this podcast is just to be able to sit down with people such as yourself and just other, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, finance people, um, macroeconomic guys, things like that. Um, How do you feel like your network has grown over the years because of the podcast? Uh, Exponentially so. The podcast opens so many doors with other people people you you never have any business uh, calling them up. Maybe they charge $1,000 an hour for their time. And you're like, hey, I got this podcast. You want to come on? <laughs> um, it's It's been fascinating. And even going to events, because I thought of myself as a writer first. Like I had this little personal blog that nobody ever read, but like that was my identity. And it's shifted over the years to say like, oh, I'm, I'm a podcaster. Because you go to events and people are like, oh, the side hustle show, right? And it was like, Oh, okay. Nobody, nobody is reading this thing, but I could put it out an episode and like instantly, you know, tens of thousands of people download it. And it's, it's very, I don't know, it's a very interesting thing. Very, again, uh, economies of scale, because it takes the same effort to produce, you know, whether 10 people listen or whether 10,000 people listen, but it's, um, it's been a really rewarding and, and honestly life-changing 
experiment for me for what started with, you know, 50, $60 mic in the living room. Like, and like, let's, let's turn this on. Let's see what happens. See how it works. Absolutely. Um, so if you had to start either, you know, YouTube blog podcast, what are you starting knowing what you know now, let's call it five years ago. Oh, five years ago. Um, I, I, I'm still high on the future of podcasting, right. but man, you make a compelling case for YouTube. I see what you've done there in, in a much shorter span of time. I think it's the, it's the, it's riding the rocket ship, whereas podcasting is kind of the long, slow game. Mm -hmm. If there's a way to do both and maybe it's the the clip show, maybe it's video style interviews, but I think there's a way to play in both ecosystems um, and, and win. I definitely think YouTube is the faster path today, though. Very good. Okay, Nick, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on today. Um, hopefully, the listeners got some gems of information from you just being a tried and true serial entrepreneur. Um, if you want to leave my audience with anything, one piece of advice, and then maybe you know, give uh, the audience some places where they can find you, obviously, your website and blog and podcast. Um, but what is one piece of advice that you'd give any aspiring entrepreneurs or people that want to get into this space uh, for the future? The biggest thing for me is to think like a scientist, think like an experimenter. And the reason I say that is like, you're going to have failures along the way. Like as you, as you embark on this entrepreneurial journey, you know, the, the proverbial test tube is going to blow up in your face and that's fine. That's normal. That's natural. But like the scientist in the lab, right? The experiment didn't fail. They just learned something like they proved or disproved their hypothesis. Right. And so it's kind of back to the drawing board. What do we learn from that? How can we uh, get better, smarter uh, for the next experiment? And I think positioning, uh, even just you know, sometimes pretty big projects that I started, positioning them in my mind as an experiment. Hey, going to try this out, going to see what happens. And to me, that's that's easier than saying like, "Oh, baby, I'm going all in. <laughs> uh, if this better work. If this doesn't work, like it's you know, we're out on the streets, kind of a thing." So starting small and and trying to putting on that, putting on that scientist lab coat a little bit. It's definitely been helpful for me and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully for you guys as well. Uh, SideHustleNation.com slash ideas is a great place to start. If you are, are in the uh, side hustle sidelines, you want to get into the game. That's a, uh, a good starting point to see what is in the realm of possibility. And of course, I uh, would love to have you tune into the side hustle show as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on Nick today. I really appreciate your time, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Whiteboard Finance Show. To read more about today's episode, visit whiteboardfinance.com. And don't forget to subscribe to Whiteboard Finance on YouTube. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. While it is possible to minimize your risk, your investments are solely your responsibility. This show is copyrighted by Zlatic Media LLC. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or broadcasting.